All right, are we ready to start? Uh, well, good evening, and uh, thank you for joining me for the first of the uh, forums uh, this year. Uh, it's uh, 62 degrees on a March night, so I'm really pleased uh, uh, that you decided to stay with us. Uh, with me here are uh, most of the city department heads, the cabinet officers, uh, who are going to be here to be able to answer any question you have on any department. So no matter how specific your issue is in your particular area, please uh, ask it. Uh, and uh, we'll see if we can't get you an answer tonight, or if not, we'll get back to you tomorrow. Uh, I did a long speech the other day, so this is going to be very short. Uh, but I do want uh, to talk about um, the most pressing issue. And it probably won't surprise you that what I want to talk to you about is COVID. Uh, and We've talked about these numbers before. Uh, this is today's infection rate. Detroit's at 7%, Suburban Wayne's at 10%, Oakland's at 8%, Macomb's at 13%. Those numbers on their face look good. Uh, and the, re the result of a lot of hard work. When COVID first hit, there was a lot of talk about the racial gaps in health care in this country, and they are very real. Those first few months, uh, African Americans were dying of COVID at three times the rate of Caucasians who were getting the disease. And uh, there was a belief in the national media that there was nothing uh, that a city like Detroit could do. But as you know, uh, we fought back. We had the most advanced testing program in the country. The people of the city embraced social distancing and the mass. Our health department did a terrific job enforcing at restaurants or bars that weren't following. And for the last nine months, the city of Detroit has had a lower infection rate than the surrounding suburbs. And I've been pleased that the national shows I've been asked to do the last couple months uh, were, how is Detroit doing this? How are the people of the city of Detroit with more dense population riding buses having lower infection rates than the people in the surrounding suburbs. And it's because we made that commitment. We protected our residents in a remarkable way. But I'm not showing you this right now to talk about our success. I'm showing you this because it's starting to slip away. This margin is narrowing. Uh, three, four months ago, uh, the suburbs were two or even three times Detroit's infection rate. Uh, but we are seeing it slip, and I'm going to show you why. Uh, in the coming week, the 100,000 Detroiter will get vaccinated. What Hakeem Barry and the team have done uh, at the TCF Center is nothing short of remarkable. But it isn't nearly enough, and I want to ask you tonight for your help. Because here's what we're seeing. These are the infection rates in the city of Detroit in the last 10 days. And they have doubled to 7%. If they double again in the next 10 days, uh, we're going to be uh, in a much worse situation. And we know what is happening. This British variant uh, is here in Michigan in a very significant way. And there's no doubt it's contributing to this. And what is more troubling is what's happening in the hospitals. Uh, we had 60 or 70 people in the hospitals just a couple weeks ago. Today, we had 115. A 33% jump in hospitalizations of Detroiters in less than two weeks is something that we haven't seen. And we have the tools right now in the city to stop this in its tracks and to have this city back for the summer, which is what I'm hoping we're going to do. Because here's our problem. While we uh, led this state in testing, while we led this state in wearing masks and distancing, while we led this state in enforcement in bars and restaurants, we are not leading this state in our vaccination rates. And so the number of adults who have gotten at least one dose as of today across the state is 26%. In the city of Detroit, it's only 16%. And in Detroit, you can make a phone call, have your call answered in a few minutes, be scheduled in the next couple of days. Detroiters have access to vaccines like nobody else. We should not be lagging behind. But it's going to start to show up in the health care in this city. If we don't change this trend, I'm going to predict, I'm going to be standing here before the end of May, 
and it's going to be Detroit with the highest infection rate, not the suburbs. This is something that's within our control. Uh, if you've been fully vaccinated, I want to talk to you what life is like. This is why, why do we want to do this? Aside from the fact that it would be good not to get really sick, particularly with the British variant here, the CDC this month has issued guidelines. And here's what they say you can do once you've been vaccinated, which is basically two weeks after your second shot. You can gather indoors with other fully vaccinated people without wearing a mask. This is starting to happen in City Hall now. We're having meetings where we're all sitting around talking without masks because we've all been fully vaccinated. It's actually uh, a really nice feeling to be sitting around talking to each other uh, like normal people again. We're not that far away. If you get vaccinated and the people close to you get vaccinated, you can spend time with them without worrying about the mask. Here's the second thing you can do. You can gather indoors with one other family from one other household who have not been vaccinated. So what this means, for example, is if I'm with my brother's family where they haven't all been vaccinated, I don't have to wear a mask because they can't infect me, at least it's extraordinarily unlikely, so we can spend time together like normal people. Now, maybe you say, oh, well, I'm getting together with my family and I'm not wearing masks anyway. I can't tell you the number of people I've heard who told me I got COVID from my sister. I got COVID from my nephew when he visited. Uh, these fa family gatherings have been a huge part of the spread. But if one of the families is fully vaccinated, you can be together and have a barbecue in the backyard without wearing masks. This is what the vaccine will do. It helps you get your life back. And the third thing is if you've been exposed to someone with COVID, you don't need to quarantine or get tested unless you show symptoms. Again, I'll tell you how this worked in my life. We had somebody who was in our office, very close quarters with a lot of our staff, who got COVID a couple of weeks ago, a very bad case. None of us had to go quarantine. None of us had to leave because we were protected. None of us got uh, the vaccine. Had this been six months ago, there's a good chance several of us would have had COVID and certainly we all would have had to quarantine for 14 days. So again, it starts to give you your life back. This is the Center for Disease Control. This is what they're saying you can do if you get the vaccine. And so it isn't just about your health. It's about can I go out to a restaurant again and not have to worry? It is almost indescribable the relief you feel once you're fully vaccinated and somebody wants to go out to the restaurant, wants to go out to the bar, wants to have a picnic, and you don't have to worry because you've made it a point to do the right thing. So um, I am here today to ask for the help for those of you who have been vaccinated because by now everybody in this country has heard the doctors from Dr. Fauci to your local doctors, heard every politician, me, the governor, everybody else. You know who they're gonna most listen to? They'll listen to you. If you've been vaccinated, tell your friends, tell your neighbors what it was like. It's not a big deal. It doesn't really hurt, okay? Maybe your arm's sore for a little bit, but the stress that's off your life is remarkable. And so we are gonna start a media campaign that you've been seeing all the campaigns with the doctors and the nurses and everything else, and those are all fine. Um, but we're going to start our own campaign because I believe the people who are most persuasive to Detroiters are Detroiters they know and trust who have already been vaccinated, who just tell them the truth. So it was just the most first day organized. You drive down, and they had at least a dozen lanes. Someone came up, got your paperwork. Next thing you know, you're being vaccinated. You pull up, you're waiting for the 15 minutes for observation, and you're out. These are the kind of ads we're going to be running. Short, 15 seconds, social media, television, uh, maybe at, at gas stations when you fill gas. But all we're going to do now is we're going to ask for Detroiters to tell your story. People know when you're telling the truth. Uh, and the only way we're going to change this trajectory is if you talk to the people that you care about, the people in your life, say, I'll drive you down to TCF. I'll take you down to Ford Field. Uh, and we'll get this vaccine uh, together. So who can get vaccinated at TCF today? And everybody knows the number by now, 313-230-0505. Anybody who has to go to work on a job site, whether you live or work in Detroit, if 
you uh, live uh, in the city of Detroit and you're going out to work at a restaurant in Southfield because you live in Detroit, you can get the vaccine. If you live in Southfield and you come to work at a restaurant in Detroit because you're working in Detroit, you can get the vaccine because these are the folks who are interacting with the most people. And so the best way to stop this infection spread is to take those who are interacting and make sure that they are safe. You can call, probably for another few minutes, but certainly tomorrow, uh, and, and you can get an appointment within a couple of days. Anybody who's 50 or over, and any Detroiter who's 60 or over with a chronic medical condition, uh, whether you've got a heart condition, you've got diabetes, you've got asthma, whatever your condition is, you can call and get an appointment, and you'll be in by next week, maybe even uh, this week. On April 5th, which I think is a week from Monday, uh, every resident of the state of Michigan 16 and over is eligible for vaccine. So we won't be talking about these categories anymore. Everybody can call. But for the next couple weeks, uh, if you've got a chronic condition and you want to get ahead of the rush, you work uh, uh, not in your home but on a job site, you can come in and get ahead of the rush. Now, again, we have a remarkable opportunity here. We already had great vaccination access uh, at TCF, but thanks to the governor and FEMA, you're going to have a second great option at Ford Field. And so if you want to have the experience of parking in the parking structure and waiting inside in line at Ford Field, you can go there. If you want to stay in your car and come through the drive through experience, you can go to TCF. Detroiters can do either one. Uh, whatever is the most comfortable for you, it's going to be basically the same vaccine no matter where you go. It's just a matter of what's your personal comfort. You've got even more choices now. So. Here's the difference. At TCF, you can be a Detroiter 50 and up. At Ford Field, anybody in Michigan 50 and up. So if a Detroiter wants to go to Ford Field, you can. Uh, so you have those choices. At Ford Field, you're 16 or over with a disability or medical condition, you can go there. Anybody in Michigan. In Detroit, at TCF, you can go there. But if you're 45 years old and you've got a heart condition, you can choose either one, whichever one you like better. Here's the only difference right now, is that Ford Field is not taking the folks who are at the work sites. And so if you are going to work in the city or you live in the city, you've got to call the number of TCF. That's the way the two work together. Tomorrow, Ford Field is going to start. Within a week, you're going to see more than 10,000 vaccines a day between Ford Field and TCF, and probably in three weeks, we're going to be closer to 15,000 a day. It is a remarkable uh, achievement, uh, and I'm just thrilled that the governor uh, and the president made a commitment here uh, to the city of Detroit, but also for those who are in the surrounding suburbs, Ford Field is going to be available to you as well. So uh, the process uh, is simple enough. At TCF, you call the number. Ford Field, you register online. Uh, and they will call you and give you uh, an appointment. So either way, whatever works the best for you. And then if you don't want to come downtown, uh, we are in churches and community centers every single weekend. Uh, this weekend from 9 to 1 on Saturday, we're at Great Faith, Greater Emmanuel, New Providence, and Galilee uh, Baptist. And we will be at different churches and different rec centers every single Saturday so that we'll be coming out to the community uh, as well as providing the options uh, downtown. Uh, and so that's uh, what we're trying to do right now. I am really hopeful uh, that we can drive this vaccination rate up. I really think there's a chance that this summer the city of Detroit looks a lot like normal that we're out on the riverfront, that we're on Livernoy, that we're on Grand River, that we're on Verner, that we're out like we used to be. If we get vaccinated, and these vaccines are going to be available in April and May and June at numbers you couldn't even imagine a couple months ago, we can get our lives back. And so please, if you've been vaccinated, call your friends, call your family, uh, and, and let's see if we can't get them to join us. Uh, and so the rest of this time, uh, we're going to talk about what's on your mind. Uh, and so the process is there on how you raise your hand, uh, whether you're on a Mac or Windows. Uh, when you raise your hand and you get called on by the host, uh, tell them your name. Uh, and 
we want to get everybody in uh, that we can get through. I'd like to get through every question. Uh, and it's part of why I'm keeping this initial part so short. Uh, but after 60 seconds, you will be muted. So please get to the point of your question early. If you've got a particular department you want to talk to, uh, we'll have the department head come up and take your uh, questions directly. And with that, we'll take the first question. First, Nicole. Oh, uh, thank you. Good evening, Mayor. Nicole Curtis here. How are you? I recognize your voice. It's good to talk to you, Nicole. I know. Isn't that crazy? Everyone recognizes the voice. So, Mayor, obviously you've stated um, that you're aware of our issues with the Detroit Land Bank Authority. But most importantly today, I'm approaching this as a taxpayer in Detroit who can't even get city services to come out to one of our properties without a three-month wait list um, from the Detroit Water and Sewer. So my question is, is that now that we know that you are aware of all these issues, not only with the Detroit Land Bank, but also with city services, why is it that you aren't open to sitting down with teams such as ours that are very, very knowledgeable of the processes and the systems that your city has established so that we could come up with a better way um, to put our team together with yours to make all these have easier and better access for the citizens of Detroit. Uh, Nicole, I will sit down with you anytime. And as you remember, the first time you came in to see me, and this was a remarkable story. Nicole Curtis came in. I just knew her from television fame. Uh, and she said she wanted to buy a house. I showed her how the auction at the land bank worked. She took her phone. I think, Good. Nicole, you actually bid that day on the first house, and you did a phenomenal job on that house on East Grand Boulevard. I'd love to sit down with you this week, next week, uh, and, and work through these things together. Uh, because the last time we got together, we did a lot, and I'd like to do it again. Oh, Mayor, that makes us so happy. Um, we are available uh, Thursday, anytime. If you let us know, uh, we can set up a Zoom meeting and have our team do that. Okay. Again, I do remember that moment. That was, I think I even had my dog with me at the time. Um, but again, you know, our feeling is that we are always here to better serve uh, Detroit as a whole. Um, that has always been our goal with bringing the show back um, and also to bring global attention to the positive things that happened to Detroit. Unfortunately, there's been a breakdown and we are so open to resolve and we are so excited to do that. So you let us know a time. So how's, our how's team will definitely make ourselves available. How's 8.30 Thursday for you? 8.30 a.m.? Yeah. You get up that early? <laughs> I sure do. I sure do. I do get up that early because uh, our job site start at 6 a.m. And as much as everyone loves to watch our show on TV, I am still uh, on our job site. So, yes, that would be great. So, so my office will get in touch with you first thing in the morning. Let's plan a Zoom call for 830. All right. Is Thank you. OK, who's next? Next is Christine. Christine. OK. Go ahead, tell, tell us your, your name and uh, where you live. Christine, you must unmute yourself. Christine, can you unmute? There you go. Okay, I'm done now. There we go. Okay. Where, where do you live? I live in Detroit, Michigan. I actually live on the east side of Detroit. Wh which neighborhood? And I'm at, uh, oh. off of Harper and Van Dyke. Okay. And I actually have a couple issues, but I know it's going to take too long. But I have three lots on the side of me, which they allow me to purchase one. And these two lots have been open for the last 15, 20 years mm -hmm. since my dad was living. He was fighting to get them. The city does not come out and cut them at all. I cut them regularly every two weeks. They, they, we got houses over here that's been burnt up since 2010 that they had red tags and said we're supposed to be torn down they haven't torn those down now i'm having a problem with the garbage so let me start you with the lots because i want to see if i can get you these lots are the the lot that that you were able to buy was it right next to your house yes it is are the other two lots next to that lot yes they are and does the land bank own them Yes, yeah. they do, and they have not put them up for sale in the last eight years. Okay, in that case, so you are allowed to buy the adjacent lots. You can keep going right down the block. So I'm going to ask Saskia Thompson, the land bank director, to come up here. But uh, if you're right, the land bank owns those properties, you can buy those two lots. Uh, Saskia, you want to come up and talk about uh, uh, how Christine can get in touch with you and we can get this worked out? Do 
Sure. So I'm Saskia Thompson. I'm the executive director for the Detroit Land Bank Authority. <clears throat> I need to know the address of the lots and contact information for uh, of how to reach you, and we can look up and figure out how we can um, transfer those lots so to you. Let her know to give that offline. I don't want her. Yeah. Uh, so we don't want you to give your contact information online, but we'll make sure that we, we get it before the meeting is over, and then I'll contact you tomorrow. That's great. Christine, did you have another question? Did I lose her? Uh, it, keeps, um, it keeps muting me. Can you hear me? Yes. Did you have another question? Uh, yes. Okay. Now, we have like seven burnt up houses on our block. There's only actually three that's livable, and they've been burnt up since 2010. My dad has been fighting since before he died in 2014 to get them torn down. In 2000, uh, the middle of 2014, they came out, they red tagged the houses and said they would be torn down that year. No one has been out yet to tear them down. Them and they're hazards. I mean, you can't even walk up to them. They'll fall. They're burnt that bad. So um, fortunately, we, we basically had demolition shut down in this city for a year. Uh, but fortunately, the people uh, of Detroit passed proposal, and in November, the first 1,300 uh, house co demolition contracts were approved by city council about two weeks ago and will be there this summer. But we're going to get your contact information, and I'm going to have the District 4 district manager call you tomorrow, and we can tell you address by address whether any of those addresses are scheduled to be demolished uh, this year uh, or whether or when you can expect that. So let us get you, get you the right answer. But we know the 1,300 addresses, they've all been contracted. Uh, we just need to find out if any of those happens to be by you. All right. And so, Christine, make sure you give us your name and contact before you hang up so that we can reach you tomorrow. Well, we have that information. You've got it. Great. Okay. Who's next? Uh, the next uh, person is over... Okay, please introduce yourself and, and tell me what neighborhood you live in. Uh, yes, I'm, my name is Reuben Crowley. I live in uh, District 3. Okay. My question to you is, uh, are you, have you been contacted by any members of the Detroit City Council about the bombshell that was dropped on them today regarding the uh, OCI, BOPC, and the DPD? OCI Chief Investigator Lawrence Akbar was, an uh, uh, audio tape was played on him during the uh, city council meeting today, along with uh, his executive assistant of the BOPC, uh, John Your Underwood. There are also tapes of Willie Bell, um, <clears throat> okay, I, I missed the council meeting and, today. Well, you should have watched. You should have watched it. It was uh, interesting. Okay. There was a bombshell dropped on the city council. Um, the whole OCI uh, BOPC has been compromised. Okay. You have about uh, four minions on the uh, BOPC. All right, your, your uh, time's going to be up. Is you have a particular question? I'm sorry, I don't. I, I, during the day, I, I, I'm. Are you, I'm are, are you willing to address that matter? And uh, how do you feel about corruption? And what will you be willing to do about it? And when it is presented to you in a um, logical, thought out, uh, concise format. Well, I I'll, I'll handle it appropriately. This is the first time hearing of it. So there wasn't any talk in City Hall about this today, at least not that reached my office. But let me check into it. But thank you. Uh, I'll find out about that. Next is Cunningham. Incre Cunningham. Tell, tell us, introduce yourself and tell us what neighborhood you live in. Is Cunningham there? Cunningham. How you doing, Mr. Mayor? Good. How are you? Uh, I, I'm in uh, Councilman McAllister's district. Uh, uh, which, which neighborhood Hope are you Park in? Area. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Which neighborhood? In the Palmer Park area. Okay. Uh, Covington. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, I've been an uh, active in regards to public transportation for a while, coming to council meeting on a regular basis. I talk to Dan Dirks all the time. And uh, I appreciate you when you brought him on board. Uh, things got better. Um, but Detroit Department of Transportation has a lot of issues still. And I thank God for you and for what uh, our president Biden had done just to meet pullout years ago. Right. Um, 
And so I, I'm familiar with the benefits and, and the changes that have been done, but there's a lot, a lot to be desired. But where would you like to see us start? I agree with you. So if, if we could do one thing better right now, what would it be? Uh, a 24 hour line where people can call in and speak to someone when they have a problem on the spot at night and supervisors, actual supervisors after 5 p.m. that drive around and hold them accountable. I make good money as a taxi driver now um, after 5 p.m. and at night because the buses are just horrible uh, after dark, um, especially on the weekends. And um, I shouldn't care. Time. Okay, so you got, okay, this gentleman is a great idea. I want Michael Oglesby, the head of DDOT, uh, to come up and talk about this because I think this is a great idea. Michael, is there something we can do about this? Michael Oglesby, Executive Director, uh, Transportation. Absolutely, there's something that can be done. As a matter of fact, uh, we are working on uh, advancing uh, customer service to 24 hours. We, uh, we are moving forward to make sure we try to put it in the, uh, the budget moving forward. And we have been talking to our, our customer service reps to get some ideas on how to make things better. And I truly believe once we get to that point, um, it'll be taken care of. Um, so the, I think we had DDOT going the right direction before uh, COVID hit, uh, what our drivers uh, had to, to deal with with the risk uh, to, to their lives. Uh, but if you look at what we did over the last year, we now have the barrier doors uh, protecting each driver. Uh, we've got more seats available because we've made progress. We're getting more uh, buses on the road. Uh, and um, with the uh, support we've had from President Biden, there's been a lot of support to transit to give us an opportunity uh, to upgrade that service. So we know it's not where it needs to be, uh, but uh, we've got a great director uh, that we recruited uh, from Florida. I told him how great the weather was here, uh, and I'm confident that Director Oglesby is going to move this in the right direction. But thank you. Great suggestion. Phone number ending in 262. If you want to raise your hand on the phone, please press star 9 on your telephone keypad. Okay, so if your number ends in 262, introduce yourself and let us know what neighborhood you live in. Good afternoon, good evening, Mr. Mayor. This is Michael Williams, and I'm in the Brightmoor community. Um, we have spoken on several occasions in the past, and uh, the last time we spoke, you promised that you would uh, do all that's necessary to help me to complete the project that I've attempted to complete over here, which is a, uh, a park that was named after my mother, the Thalgeme Williams Park. Um, I have been in contact with uh, Deputy Mayor Conrad Mallet and several others, and, and quite frankly, we have not gotten anywhere. And, and I am eager to put together a schedule that would be of benefit to the entire neighborhood over here to help. Uh, I, I think that everybody will uh, attest to the fact that I have done all that I could to help to mitigate the illegal dumping, and I'm doing all that I can to help to eliminate and mitigate crime in this neighborhood. But I need the backing of the city, and uh, I'd like to actually have a meeting with yourself so that we can uh, hammer out the details of what it is that I'm attempting to do. And, and, and if we can't, you know, if I can't get you to, to make this happen, uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll walk away from it. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm glad to, to talk with you. As you know, I've been on your side from the beginning, but I see the deputy mayor is here, and I know he's going to work this out. So I'm going to have the deputy mayor come up and address this. Mr. Williams, good to hear from you. Uh, I have in front of me the licensing agreement, Mr. Mayor, that we hammered out, approved by uh, Corporation Counsel Lawrence Garcia. You asked for, Mr. Williams, permission to use the city land. We gave it to you. You asked for permission to allow, have special events where you were actually going to charge a fee to come on land that you did not own. And thanks to the creativity of the Corporation Counsel's Office, we were able to work that out. You ask that you reduce the cost associated with uh, coming onto that land to make the park that you described to the mayor. Originally, Mr. Mayor, we were saying we were going to charge you $2,500 per lot. 
we reduce that, as you know, Mr. Williams, down to $10 per lot per year. Total cost, $250. You also asked, could you put non-permanent fixtures on that land? And we said yes to that. The only thing that we said no to, Mr. Williams, was your request that we buy your land for $10 million. We suggested to you that transferring $10 million of City of Detroit funds to you would have been illegal. You have in front of you our last best offer. I have asked you on numerous occasions, and the last time was February 14th. If you had additional requests or different ideas, I am here at the direction of the mayor to solve this problem. What we cannot do is give you $10 million. What we cannot do is give you permission without council approval to have special uh, uh, events on land that we own and that we would be more than happy to allow you to use. We can work this out, Mr. Williams, but it is going to be a negotiation and a compromise. We are prepared to be helpful. What we are not prepared to do is exactly everything that you ask, except meet every single request that you've made to us thus far. You got my number, you got my email, you got my cell number, you've got James Tate, you've got Gary Brown, uh, you've got Lawrence Garcia. When you're ready, Mr. Williams, we're ready. This is what I love about these sessions. I learn so much. Uh, Mr. Williams, is there a basis to work this out without us writing you a check? Did we lose him? Hello? Yeah, is there, this a, Mr. Mayor? Is there a way to work this yeah, out without us writing you a check? Is in, yeah, there's a basis. And, and I, all I want to do is to have the city to uh, negotiate with me fairly. Uh, it's interesting that the deputy mayor came up with this uh, with the license agreement. I guess he was anticipating his phone call. <laughs> it did seem um, that way, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, most of the things that he took, he did not mention the fact that he had offered me six months worth of protection. For me to make a capital investment in this property over here with six months where the city can come in and pull the rug out from beneath me, it would, would not be of prudence to anybody. And I, and I would just like the, the city to get on my side and help me to do this. Uh, July 9th, July 29th of last year, 10 days after my, my, my 59th birthday, for the first time in my life, myself was going after the, at the aid of one of my female neighbors uh, who was in distress. I was shot at for the first time in my life. In the, in, the, in the community of Brightmore. And it was not a good feeling. Uh, we submitted surveillance video to the police, and, and to this day, nothing has happened. Eight days ago, I was threatened again by someone over here. I'm trying to do what's necessary to make this community safe, and I think that Mr. Malik can attest to that. Mr. And Mayor, I would like for him question. to negotiate. So can I ask you a question? Is, if we got you more protection than six months, can we finish this deal? Is he muted or is he thinking? Yeah, yeah, every, this, I keep becoming muted. So, yeah, absolutely. And that's all I've asked of the deputy that's, mayor. If that's all you want is more time to protect you for the city not to pull it out, uh, Conrad, we can work that out, can't we? He's, he's looking at I, And again, he looks I think, at, Mr. Mayor, it would be better if I can just get you on the Zoom call. Okay. Anyway, I will participate. If that's the last issue we're down to, I'll participate as well. And uh, we will get this done. I do believe in what you're trying to do there. Uh, and it would be nice if just one time you called into one of these and you were happy with me. So we're going to shoot for that as a goal. All right. But we'll, get it, we'll get it set up, and I will participate in the next one. All right. So thank you for your persistence, Mr. Williams. We'll get this worked out. Thank you. Okay. All right. Who's next? E.A. Bloom, if you introduce yourself and tell us what neighborhood you live in. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? I can. Thanks. My name is Greg Newsom. I live on the east side of Detroit here in the uh, FCA impact area. I've got a number of concerns, and, and uh, I'm, I'm calling today as a, as a parent of uh, three young children that, that live uh, in an area that appears to be slated for a great deal of reindustrialization due to this uh, plant. Uh, 
What street do I'm you live on? I'm extremely concerned about. I'm extremely concerned about the uh, about the environment, uh, about the the various industries that seem to be uh, coming back alive on this side of town. I don't really feel as though the city has engaged in a way that is protecting us or the residents on the east side uh, around this reindustrialization. I, I think that the city has just been focused on things like jobs instead of our health. And, and from what I hear, Detroiters aren't really getting these jobs in the first place. Fine. I'm also concerned about your demolition program. I'm concerned about the asbestos violations that we're hearing about. And uh, I'd, I'd love to know the number of violations that the city has had in the last few years. All right, so I, I didn't get the uh, uh, address, but I, let me start with the basic though, but we have uh, 2,900 Detroiters uh, have already been hired into full-time jobs and another 1,100 jobs are gonna be filled at the Jefferson uh, North plant. And we're working with uh, the state environmental department to make sure uh, that the air quality is good. So I'm not sure what the particular issue is. Okay, who's next? Phone number ending in 133. Okay, go ahead. Well, if you okay, hi. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Duggan. My name is Bernard Nashumsky. I'm a resident of the city of Detroit. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? What, yeah, what neighborhood do you live in? Um, I, grew, um, I live in a university district neighborhood, but I grew up um, just close to Grandmont Rosedale since uh, I arrived here in the U.S. in 94. I'm a lifelong Detroiter. I'm a bus rider, and I've been using the system for over 15 years. And I remember when it was funded at a level where this was a world-class system. Mayor, if you can bond demolitions for over $250 million, can we have that same level of priority for our transit system? For every $1 that you spend, if you knew this, for every $1 you spent on transit, you would generate $4 in economic growth because bus riders tend to shop in the city, spend their money in the city, and stay in the city as well and um, use the system. And I'm going to be quite frank with you. 135 or $134 million is appalling and not enough for our ailing transit system. Hi. If the city can provide transit for employees to these new factories that are opening across the city, isn't the city admitting that its transit system is inadequate? And instead of investing in it, why are we getting vehicles for employees, for factory workers, instead of investing in our system? I ride the bus daily, and sometimes I got to take a lift and Uber because I'm not going to get to where I'm going on time, Hi. paying extra uh, so let me start with the basic question. The question is, why can you sell bonds for demolition and you can't sell bonds to operate buses? And so the bonding law in this state, really everywhere in the country, is that you can borrow money for a capital purpose for the period of time uh, that it's there. So you could sell bonds for a bus terminal, uh, but you can't sell bonds to pay bus drivers or operating expenses. It just isn't legal. Uh, so we've added 40% more routes on the road since I've been here, and there's no doubt uh, we need to do uh, quite a bit more. Next caller, Tahira. Hello. Good evening. It would be if I wasn't looted out of $600 million. It would be a good evening if I was not looted in my personal life out of $5,000. It would be a good evening if you will resign, Mayor Duggan. Okay. You, you threw back 6,200 vaccines that would save black people. We are dying in Detroit. Why would you do something like that? Why would you not pay us back? There are people who lost their homes uh, from illegal foreclosures. That means there are people living in their cars today under your administration, sir, because of illegal. Your little schemes, why are you not indicted? You should be indicted for bid rigging. You should be indicted Time. for stealing. Uh, so uh, let me start with the basics, which is the people of the city will get a chance uh, to either hire me or not rehire me. Uh, in less than uh, eight months. Uh, as far as the vaccines, every single Detroiter who's eligible, who wants a vaccine, can call today uh, and get one. No one 
in the city has ever been denied uh, the opportunity to get a vaccine timely. And relative to the uh, $600 million issue, I think we need to be honest about this as far as what happened. I'm the one who stopped the overassessments. What happened in 2009 and 2010, long before I was mayor, when the property values dropped, this city did not drop the assessments far enough. And in 2011, there was a significant overcharge. A lot of people appealed, a lot of people didn't. Uh, that money went to the city, it went to the county, most of it went to the schools. And at some point we need to have a conversation uh, about the mayor and the president of the school board in 2011 who were complicit uh, in these overassessments and benefited from it. In 2012, the city auditor general issued a full report on this. In 2013, I campaigned against the overassessments in every corner of this city. And my second month in office, in February 2014, one of the very first things I did was cut the assessments of everybody in the city by 20%. We were in bankruptcy, but I cut the assessments by 20% because they were too high. Uh, there is more that we can do, but I think we need to be honest about how it came about uh, and what we've done to correct it. Next is Brenda. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, introduce yourself and tell us what neighborhood you're from. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I am Brenda Butler. I am in District 4. My question of the evening is, Mr. Mayor, why did you find in your heart to request of Scott Benson to go before the City Council and cut the budget of the city charter commission. Why would you say that? Because this I, I is what say, for most happened. part, people can say what they want. We made a recommendation on the budget to city council. It was the mayor's but recommendation. That, city please. council cut my recommendation. I mean, that's just the truth of what happened. Well, that's not what was portrayed by the uh the city council and scott benson and i heard the meetings yeah so that's why i'm record, saying the it. record is clear if i sent a budget true, and if it's city not council. true mr mayor then all right who's next we're ending in eight zero four okay if you're in eight zero four introduce yourself and tell us what neighborhood you're from Eight zero four. You may unmute yourself. Hello. Good evening. Hello, Mayor Duggan. How are you? Hi, I, I'm great. Uh, my name is Betty A. Barner, president of DeSoto, Ellsworth Black Association, a.k.a. Diva. We are excited about the work the city is doing in the neighborhoods throughout the city of Detroit. We are patiently waiting for the city to come to the Finkel and Livernois neighborhood to do some good work bringing projects to this community. Mayor Duggan, I sent you an email giving you a little history about the members of our Black Club and our vision for our community. Please read the email. Thank you for this time. Uh, I, sent I, want, I want to follow up with you. And what I would really love to do is schedule a Zoom meeting with your block club. So I know Pastor Wilkerson over in that area has renovated about 25 houses. Uh, but we've been working our way down Livernoy toward you. But do you think we could do a Zoom call with, with your neighbors and do a meeting that way? They won't let us gather in person yet. Would that work? Hello? Hello. Hello. Could, could we do Can you hear me? Yeah. So are you in? I heard some of you faded out. I don't know what's going on. I heard some of what you said. You said something about a Zoom call. So you're. I in, apologize. You're, you're in District Two, right? District Five? Seven. I'm um, right where well, one side of Finkel is District Two, I see. and right. the other side is District Seven. All right. So Mona Ali is going to reach out to you, and and let's set up a Zoom call with your block club, your neighborhood group. And let's talk together. I want to hear what you want to do in the neighborhood and get a chance to talk, if that would be all right. Oh, yeah. That Sorry. Uh, the next caller is. Okay, Ray, will you make sure that gets set up? Yes. Good. Okay. Sorry. 
Uh, next caller is Beverly. Okay, Beverly, if you introduce yourself and tell us what neighborhood you're from. Hello, hi, this is Beverly Kendall Walker calling. Oh, how are you? Uh, how, how are you? Good. Wonderful. I live in West Village, although some people might think I live at the airport. But That's I what I thought. <laughs> but anyway, I'm calling you about the uh, high-speed internet service that we desperately need uh, in that corridor. And uh, you had some talk about it a year or so ago. And I know everything has happened, but we do need a high-speed internet service, especially when the students come back uh, once we do face-to-face -face at the airport, the ninth and 10th graders. So we do need that service. Also, I'm looking for a replacement of the banners that we had welcoming our fair travelers to our city. Oh, yeah. Uh, Alexis, Alexis, put those banners up. What happened to them? Well, uh, they deteriorated, so they need to be replaced. All right. Well, Tricia Stein's got Alexis's job. Now, we got to get those fixed. Uh, I want to, uh, I don't see Beth Niblock here, uh, but she and her team are very intensely working on a bunch of digital divide initiatives. Uh, and we will find out what's going on uh, with the connection at the airport because you got those students there. We got to make sure they have uh, the kind of support they deserve. Right. DPS has put a lot of work in into our, their infrastructure there, but we do need high speed uh, internet. My other question concern is about Heart Plaza. I hope we'll be able to shore up some of those loose um, uh, pavings and stuff. Yeah. Because. That is our heart of our city, and a lot of people do frequent that just to be outdoors. Uh, that would be nice. My final thing is the Nelson Mandela Drive. When you come down to CCF, CCF to get your uh, shot, right. the directions tell you to take the Steve Eisenman Drive, but that drive ends at Nelson Mandela Drive, so it would be You're nice. Right. That's where he took the walk. <laughs> uh, you know what? We should change the branding on that. Hakeem Barry's here, uh, but that's a great point. Uh, so we should change the, the branding. Uh, Hakeem, are you up on where we are in the repairs and the tiles at Hart Plaza? Is, any, is anybody here up on that? Okay. So, so Beverly, I know there's a repair project coming because I signed off on it a few months ago. Uh, the person who's in charge isn't in the room right now, but I'm confident we're going to get to it uh, this summer. But we, we have a design done, and I think you're going to like it. Next is Jim. Hey, Jim, introduce yourself and let us know what neighborhood you live in. Jim Ward from Green Acres, the famous District 2. Yeah, you're How famous from the parents? television commercial, Mr. Ward. Good to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, I saw that guy. He needed a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you one thing. The friends of mine throughout the country, and uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast, down, si down South, are envious of what's going on here in Detroit and how the vaccination program is, 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 is going. So I cannot say enough good things about it. My point to now is it's really a question and, and, a, and a plea for help if it's available. I don't know if we have somewhere in your office an operation in that promotes the good things that's going on in the city of Detroit, you know, throughout the, uh, the, the city and state. If there is such an operation, then my plea is for some help for the citywide radio patrols. During the pandemic, and even without the pandemic, recruiting is a big challenge for most, most of the, the patrols. So if there is a, an operation in your office that can help along that line, and working with uh, uh, Commander, oh heck, you, you, I forgot her name. You are, I agree with you 100%. Uh, what you have done, and I think you've been in charge of that radio patrol on Green Acres for, what, 20 years plus? How many has it been, Mr. Ward? Or do I lose them again? Uh, in any event, uh, we are about to hire somebody who's going to play exactly that role. Uh, and Hakeem, uh, if you would let our, our new communications director know the first order of business is, uh, let's highlight the great work of these uh, radio patrols and let's keep... Uh, are recruiting for it in the in the neighborhoods where they're operating it has made a real difference and thank you for what you've done mr ward next is gaston hey gaston introduce yourself and let us know what neighborhood you're in uh, this is gaston nash from uh, the fitzgerald neighborhood okay how um, are things going over there uh that's that's what i want to uh talk to you about um so um is 
it's been about a couple of years since uh, you met with the community over here. Right, at Mary um, right, right. And a lot of things have changed. I'm sure you know about them, um, uh, about the about the Fish Hero Project. Um, I, I've been asking Kim, uh, and, and actually all of our uh, Block Club uh, presidents have been asking Kim to uh, bring you back to a meeting uh, to get you updated and or and uh ask you um for uh specific things that that uh can be done to help um kim jermaine and alexa have been doing a great job i, I do want to say that but uh we do want to try to get you back to one of our meetings um so we can we can discuss some things that that was one thing so i would say uh, we'll get kim to set up a zoom meeting i learned so much uh at your last uh, at the last meeting it was a great meeting and i think we both got some things done. I'd love to do it again. And Kim just walked in and she said she'll make sure to set it up. Go ahead. Did you have another question? Yes. Hello, Mr. Mayor Duggan. Hi. I, I would like to ask you some questions. Okay. Well, tell me your name. My name is Darius Bradley Jr. And I am eight years old. And I live in Berg, Flasher, um, this for one. Okay, what would you like to talk about? I would like to talk about employment with opportunities for youth mining in the city of Detroit. So go ahead. And Tell me what we should be doing. Who's, who's your teacher? Miss Williamson. She's going to be very proud of you tomorrow. So go ahead. Tell me what's the first thing that I should be doing better than I'm doing now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I asked the wrong question. <laughs> Appointment for youth my age. For eight-year-olds? Yeah. You've got a lot of years in front of you to work. What would you like to be doing? Um, I have another question real quick. Okay. When will summer camps open up? Yeah. Boy, it was, uh, uh, is there anybody here from recreation? Do we do summer camps anymore? You're asking a really good question. Have you ever been to a summer camp? Yeah, but call me on Rex and me. Okay, was it fun? Yeah, very fun. Okay. Yeah, that is a that is a really good activity for us to do. Uh, go ahead, you're on a roll. What else should I be doing? Music. There's a lot of people when I'm trying. I mean, other people try to sleep, and then and then people driving crazy and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. You you want to hear from the police chief? Yeah. Okay, he's gonna fix those things. <laughs> How you doing, young man? I got I'm some. Good. I got some good news you? for you. I'm very well aware of these crazy drivers. You know the people doing the drifting or the 360s, the circles in the street, the speeding. Uh, and we've been working very hard with our community. Uh, and over the last several weekends, we've impounded a number of cars, seized a number of cars. And you know what I'm hopeful for? We're gonna make those cars into undercover police cars. That's my commitment. And we're going to use those undercover police cars to go after more people that are driving illegally. So just know we're working very hard for you. I feel it. Uh, everybody I've talked to around the city, uh, they are really supporting us right now. Anything, anything you think I should be doing differently uh, with these uh, bad drivers? Yeah. Just make sure they're not really drunk. Oh, we'll take care of that as well. We'll take care of that. Anything else? <laughs> oh, one thing. Make sure to follow me on Instagram, okay? Oh, okay. I got you. I'll follow you on Instagram. <laughs> All right. Well, Nicole Curtis has some competition tonight as far as a following. That was a great call. All right. Who's next? Next is Mr. Singletary. Okay, Mr. Singletary, please introduce yourself and tell us what neighborhood you're from. Hello, Mayor Duggan. Boy, it's hard to follow that young man after. I'm in District 6. Um, 
Uh, how are you this evening? Good. Uh, in Springwells Village. And actually, just following his question, too, and I'm, I'm thrilled to know that the city is rolling out, uh, tripling the amount of speed humps uh, because dri the driving in the area and the fast driving has been so concerning. And with young folks trying to get out, well, all people trying to get out and enjoy the, some outdoors time, um, you know, given COVID has, has been a relief. Uh, but the driving, uh, the fast driving in neighborhoods has just been too much. So I would like to ask you, Mayor, uh, what additional efforts uh, will be made uh, to curb some of the, the speeding and drag racing in the city? I know it was uh, answered by the chief moments ago, but if you could just give a little more information, please. You know, if you get the chief started on this subject, he'll talk for a while. We probably spent hours, I've spent with him, and I know he spent many more. But, Chief, why don't you talk in detail? Because there isn't a greater concern right now in this city than the hot rodding, the drifting. Uh, uh, it's really disturbing, and, and we're not going to let it continue. So, Chief, why don't you detail your plan for the public? Thank you. Yes, it's, it's been a big deal, and we've uh, we spent a lot of time addressing this issue, looking at what's, what's considered best practices. So, frankly, and, and, and some of what I'm going to tell you is very simplistic, uh, we do have helicopters that we deploy, and we, uh, several years ago, discontinued chasing uh, vehicles for traffic infractions. It's just too dangerous and dangerous our community, and so we don't chase. We just don't do it. The only time we engage in a high-speed chase is involving a felony. But that said, a lot of these suspects who are driving in a very reckless way uh, are taunting our officers. It's happening 20 to 25 times a day. Uh, but what they can outrun is a helicopter. So what we've done, we use our helicopter during those hours that we believe the drifting, the drag racing, uh, the reckless uh, driving with motorcycles and ATVs, so we use a helicopter. You cannot run a helicopter. But in addition to that, we're using undercover vehicles to track those individuals. They don't know they're police vehicles. They don't know police officers are following them. So this past weekend, by example, we impounded 20 cars, 20 cars. And of that number, we plan on seizing six of the 20. Those are the cars I was talking about with the young man about converting them into uh, undercover police cars. So I'm optimistic. I, I will say this, our first weekend launching this, this effort, uh, we did such a good job. They had planned to do it on a Sunday. Um, couldn't do it. They said it was just too many police. I was reading and I was uh, telling the mayor this earlier uh, today. Uh, they are so angry at me right now because of our efforts. This is a big focus and it's going to continue, uh, but it's a lot of work. And it takes a lot of police officers. And so those who are listening, who are wondering what we're going to do, um, we're going to be there. We're going to change this. Uh, and, and you know, the other thing, this is something that's going on in a lot of the major cities across America. They're trying to fight this, uh, this issue. Uh, I know there are other ideas out there that we're looking at. Uh, but right now, I'm optimistic. As long as we keep air support going, and I mean, our helicopters uh, and our undercover cars, I think we're going to make a great uh, difference in uh, addressing that problem. I will also tell you, I feel the pain. I know what it's like being on our freeway systems and, and seeing uh, some of these high-performance cars traveling at speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour. Uh, I have reached out uh, to the lieutenant colonel of the Michigan State Police, and I've asked him, we need your help. We need you to get more uh, visible presence on our freeways here in the city of Detroit. So he made a commitment that over in the next month that that's what he wants to do. So thank you. And so we're going to see uh, how this is going to work, but uh, instead of uh, engaging in high-speed chases, uh, we're going to spot them from above, and when they stop, go in and seize the cars. And that's what uh, the police are doing. They are seizing the cars after they've stopped, keeps the public safe, uh, and uh, we're, we're optimistic. Uh, but we've committed a lot of resources to this. We're just not going to put up with it. Okay, who's next? Next is Karen. Please unmute yourself, Karen. Okay, Karen, introduce yourself and tell us what neighborhood you're from. Yes, I'm from District 2. Okay. Uh, I guess that's the uh, Bagley neighborhood. Okay. And my question is about the street lighting. Right. And um, the bonding that was levied for the street lighting. 
Right. So uh, in 30 years, uh, those bonds are supposed to be paid off. And then uh, the lighting system comes back to the city. Okay. So that's the way that's the way it all reads. So how can we give away the public lighting assets, the buildings proper and Mustersky, et cetera, uh, when we haven't had a vote from the public? Uh, so, I'll wait for your answer. So th this was done before I got here, but I can give you the legal answer, is that the public lighting authority is a Detroit authority. The lighting authority is appointed by uh, the mayor and the council. It is a city agency with city assets. And what they did, and, and this was something that started under Mayor Bing, and I, I agree with it, was nobody, when, as Detroit headed into bankruptcy, would have loaned the city money. If you loaned the city money, it would have just been taken for the creditors. So they set up a separate authority so that you could put the money into the authority and get the lighting done, and the bankruptcy wouldn't take it away. So that's the reason they set it up that way. Uh, and it was the reason we were able, you know, to get uh, 50 or 60,000 lights out in the city in about two and a half years. Who's next? Next is Ms. Warwick. Okay. Ms. Warwick, are you with us? Go ahead, Ms. Warwick. You are unmuted. All right, let's keep going. We've got to try to get through as many of these as we can. Next is Electra. Okay, Electra, please introduce yourself and tell us what neighborhood you're from. Good evening, Mayor Duggan. I'm Electra Forbright. I live in District 5, specifically the North End. Okay. I'm a part of the Gateway Community Organization, as well as the larger alliance, which covers and represents all of the North End block clubs and community groups. I'm speaking to the question of density and concerns regarding people trying to come into the city to build things residents don't want in their area. I had the pleasure of being in a meeting with you in 2019, in which you spoke to density and the importance of it. However, we need to be careful not to push density in areas where people and the residents do not want it. Currently, there's a uh, developer trying to put together a development in the lower north end of the north end, and there are approximately 100 homeowners. They are trying to put apartments in front of people's homes with 180 renters. That may not be impressive to some people, but the residents, one, don't want it, and two, it changes the entire demographic Time. of that community. Time. So I, I'm aware of the, the issue, uh, and we have to balance the concerns. That area along Woodward uh, is an area where people live. You get good uh, bus access to just about anywhere, and if we can get apartments built that have a mix of affordable housing so that we keep uh, people of all incomes in the neighborhood is something that I want. But in this particular case, uh, I agree with you. I, I don't believe the outreach to the community has been done thoroughly enough. We are slowing this down uh, until there are some community meetings uh, and the folks in that neighborhood. I've heard from folks in that neighborhood on both sides of the issue. Uh, but the one thing I'm clear on is I don't think the people in the neighborhood have gotten answers. Uh, and so we're going to have a couple of community meetings. Uh, and we're going to evaluate from there. Uh, and I agree with you, this needs to be done in, a, uh, in an inclusive and sensitive manner. And I haven't reached a decision myself on this. Ms. Warwick, are you ready? We'll move to Kim. Good evening, Mayor. How are you? Good. Good evening. Where do you live? Um, I am in District 1. I'm in the Berg Losser neighborhood. And I was wondering why is there a strip club being built on the corner of Bergen Eight Mile within walking distance of a church and two schools? There are no strip clubs on Eight Mile. You know, I'm not aware of that. D Dave Bell, are you up on that? Okay, so I got our, our uh, inspector here. So does anybody know about this? Um, okay, I tell you what, I want Dave Bell to, if you would leave us your name and number to the person that you talked to offline here, and Dave Bell, our, uh, uh, our, our inspection uh, uh, director, is going to call you tomorrow and answer your questions. So this is the first okay. time hearing about it. Okay, thank you. Next 
next, uh, Ms. Warwick, you're unmuted. Do, do you have something to say? Next is Denise. Good evening, Mayor. Good My evening. name is Denise Lyles. I'm in District 5, the Dexter Linwood area. Um, I don't have. Sorry, I think we broke up here. I just, uh, I don't know what part it broke up on. You just but I, yourself, so go ahead. Uh, Denise Lyles, I just, I have a comment more so than a question. I just wanted to say thank you because I appreciate the way Detroit has stepped up and stood out when it comes to the vaccination and making it available for everyone. Um, I think you're doing a fantastic job with the vaccination. And I just wanted to say thank you. Well, thank you. And I have a feeling in the next few years, uh, the Dexter Linwood neighborhood is going to be uh, one of the most successful neighbors of this community. I think you, you've got a jewel over there and, and we're going to get a chance to really put some resources over there. So thank you for hanging in. Next is, oh, wow. Next is Kim. Kim? Yes. Um, I'm still the same Kim about the strip club. Oh. Um, but there's also an empty apartment complex that's near Berg on Seven Mile that's been empty for years. Okay. And now starting to dump there and graffiti it. Okay. And the last thing that we heard that Herb Strathers was supposed to be turned it into some type of veterans home, but nothing's been done with that. Is it is it boarded up or is it open? Both. Some are boarded up. Some are open. All right. So so Akeem, let's make sure Brad gets out there tomorrow. And let's get the the trash and let's let's get it boarded up. I don't know the what the story is on the owner, but uh, we will make sure to clean it up. And if uh, there's an owner that can be fined for cleaning it up, we'll do that as well. So Dave, you maybe get your inspectors out too. All right. We'll jump on that tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next is Yvette. Good evening. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, I live in uh, Grandmont Rosedale. Okay. And the uh, police chief did answer uh, one of my uh, concerns. There's a, um, a parking lot close to where I live and they, uh, uh, people frequent there. And there was a problem just uh, about a week ago with them holding a rally, you know, one of those road rallies that they do. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm really very concerned because oftentimes if you're driving in the right lane and you're trying to make a right on the street, these cars are approaching so fast, you have to drive so defensively. So I'm glad to hear that there's some kind of plan, um, you know, to mitigate that. Because I was driving on um, 94, and there were two horrific accidents, yeah. um, you know, that I saw. So I'm glad that there is something happening, and I just recommend that uh, sharing that kind of thing with the community is really important, uh, so that we know that those kinds of initiatives are going on. And so uh, I'm glad to hear you say this. So Jay Rising, our chief financial officer, is here who has been uh, questioning the need for the helicopter commitment. I think by now he understands the urgency in this city. But think about this as a tactic, and they know what we're doing by now. Uh, but if the chief seizes one of these Dodge Chargers, he may be driving the undercover vehicle himself uh, the, way, the way he drives. Uh, but if you can imagine a situation where we spot this early from the helicopters, we slip uh, the undercover vehicles into the middle of it, uh, we stay with them till they shut down and we seize the vehicles. Uh, and uh, the law department right now is, is going to be proposing a number of tougher measures, uh, but we are gonna hit this from all sides. It is an urgent issue, we're treating it as an urgent issue, uh, and you'll measure us as the uh, summer goes along, but the chief uh, calls me every Monday morning with the count on how many vehicles he seized over the weekend, and he's very committed uh, to fighting this. I don't know if you want anything more than that, or I got it for you. 
Oh, you want to talk about it more? Come on up. The mayor knows I'm, I'm so passionate about this, and, and, and he alluded to the fact uh, I don't need to take a seat because I've got my own high-performance vehicle. Uh, we had a, a great news conference on yesterday, and what I did is I got a few of our officers who all have high-performance vehicles, the same vehicles uh, that these reckless drivers are using to drift, and I wanted to send a message on the importance of responsible driving. You know, we talk a lot about gun owners who are not responsible. You leave a gun out and, and where a child could uh, get a hold of it, uh, tragic things happen. Well, it's no different with these cars. These cars put out five to 800 horsepower, and the average person cannot handle that kind of power. It's a, it's a, you, you need a certain level, skill level. So what we're going to continue to do is push out the message. Uh, certainly, I'm going to report out weekly of our progress so the community knows what we're doing. That's why we held the uh, press conference. And we know the tragic outcome of the nine-year-old who was killed uh, on an ATV. Equally important is adults and parents understanding that we can't have unsupervised children on those kind of vehicles. So we've had several accidents involving ATVs, several accidents involving uh, motorcycles, and the common cause, high speed. So it's a big deal, and we're going to continue to uh, push this, but we need your help. So when you have a location like you reported to the mayor, you know, let us know, uh, because that may not be a location that's on our radar. So thank you again. Hey. Go ahead. Next is Heather. Okay, Heather, uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you live. Heather just lowered her hand, so we'll okay. go next to Tyson. Tyson. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I just want to make a couple comments. Um, first, regarding the North End Landing development uh, in the Lower North End, I'm the secretary of the Lower North End Block Club. Um, we, as a community, are not opposed to development or density. We did nine painstaking meetings as a community to put together a development guidelines document that highlights what we want to see in terms of development. Uh, the number one part of that was ownership. We want to see more owner occupants in the neighborhood. Uh, the Lower North End right now has 100 uh, houses, uh, the vast majority of which are owner occupied. Um, and so the objection to the North End Landing development is that it would add 180 rental units to our community and completely change what this community is overnight. Um, we just want the opportunity to work with the city uh, around building something we can all agree to. Uh, we really appreciate Calvin Johnson's uh, involvement. Thank you for sending him. He'd be a great person to lead this. No, I appreciate uh, the way the community has done this. This is a significant decision. Uh, and uh, I think the questions that are being raised are legitimate ones and getting to something that, that can bring more people to your neighborhood in a way that doesn't change your character is something that we're all shooting for. So I appreciate uh, the tone that you're taking and we're gonna really try to work hard for something the neighbors can support. Next is phone number ending with 939. Okay, if your number ends in 939, you've been unmuted. Yes, hi. My name is Tyene Acevedo. I'm a, a District 6 resident. Good evening. And I'm calling just to, just to say how satisfied I am with our district manager. Eva Torres. Okay. She's done a great job of getting us some. She got her three speed bumps, which were highly needed and very welcome. She got the alley cleaned up, all the trees cut down and stuff. Really appreciate that. All right. Well, we'll pass that along to Eva to know that uh, uh, we have a satisfied uh, customer. So this is what we're trying to do. Yeah. The speed humps, the alley cleaning. Uh, you know, I, I'm very soon I'm going to be back in backyards and neighborhood meetings. And uh, the first few years, it was all the lights aren't on, the ambulances don't show up, the buses don't run. Now it's the alleys aren't clean, there's too much speeding, uh, we've got dead trees. Mm -hmm. And we're going to keep addressing them because the people uh, of this, in the neighborhoods are, 
are investing more and more in the neighborhoods, and you have a right to be demanding for your city on services. So thank you for the call, and we'll pass along the compliment to Ava. Next is Alexander. Okay, Alexander, let us know where you live. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm in the Bagley neighborhood. Okay. And the resident, um, I'll just echo some of the concerns that have been brought up tonight, um, especially with my uh, disappointment in our investment in our transit and other city services. Um, I think my neighborhood library even is still closed. And I know that's for, you know, a myriad, myriad of reasons, um, but I'm just concerned about that. Uh, but I think what is uh, to be, what we're looking forward to is getting over $800 million from the American Rescue Plan. Um, so my question is, um, you know, this is an extraordinary opportunity to strengthen our city and our services. What's the city's plan on how to allocate those funds and how will uh, residents benefit uh, from the infusion of these funds? Yeah, and so as you probably know, I, I went to Washington, D.C. and uh, lobbied heavily for that. And President Biden asked me to be uh, the national spokesperson for Democratic mayors uh, in, in pitching uh, the legislation. We ended up with a very favorable result. Uh, Treasury has not yet issued the regulations to say how we can spend it. It's to be in response to uh, uh, COVID, but I think that may be fairly broad. We're going to have about three years to spend it, uh, and the first money we'll see in May. So we know the first thing we, that the money goes for is for lost revenue. So when we came out of bankruptcy, we committed to a 10-year plan of adjustment. We said, this is what it will spend our money on in those 10 years. We have to restore that first. And I was really pleased that we're calling back about 800 employees who had been uh, partially laid off. That will be the first order of business from these funds. Uh, and then we're going to have to have a community conversation when we know what the rules are and, and talk about what do we put into intergenerational poverty? What do we put? Uh, into our houses? What do we put uh, into the bus system? But the thing is, it's, the money is only here for three years. So you have to spend it on one-time things. You can't double the size of the bus system and then in three years lay off all those drivers and, and shut down the buses. So it has to be used uh, for, for lasting uh, impact. And, and my guess is sometime in May, uh, we'll start to have those community conversations and then city council uh, and I will end up, uh, after listening to the public, uh, agree on a plan. But a good question. Next is M W M W M W. I introduce yourself and tell us where you live. Good evening, Mayor Duggan. M W is Marilyn Winfrey, <laughs> president of the Northwest. I would have known that as soon as I heard your voice. All right, how are you tonight, Marilyn? President. I'm great. I just want to say thank you for the alley cleanup campaign and to all that's given providing leadership to that uh, project. I'd also like to personally thank you for the efficient way that you and the health department and the team has gone about in getting us um, vaccinated. Uh, I think it's running very smoothly. Um, I had a few side effects, but I'm good. And I just want to say to you that that's all I'm going to say tonight, but I'm sure since everything reaches your desk, I know you've heard that I'm still committed to the neighborhood, trying to keep us safe and healthy. And I know you always say we have a long ways to go, but as long as the Lord say so, Northwest Community Block Club Association and the other community groups that working with in District 7, we're going to press on. And I heard you say that you might be doing uh, neighborhood meetings again. Yeah. Our Block Club, Northwest Community Block Club Association in May, We'll be uh, having our first lawn meeting during the summer. All of that? last year, we met on the lawn. So I'll, I'll, I will be contacting Mona to you see you invite me. And, you, out. you invite me, and I'll be there. Uh, we've made quite a bit of progress since the first time I met you in the 2013 campaign. Okay. When you weren't quite as as kind to me in the first conversation, but uh, you have been fighting the good fight over there, uh, and it's just great to see the success. And I look forward to being at your lawn meeting in May. Uh. Okay, next is Jacqueline. Jacqueline is next. What's causing this impact? Do we know? Good, good evening, Mayor. Good evening. This is my name. Yes, I'm, um, my name is Johnny Warford. I'm in District 1. Okay. I want to thank you, Deputy Mayor. I want to thank them, Kyra and Carla, for all they have done for me when I call them. I also want to speak on tonight is 
like I said, we're in District 1, and I'm also an O'Hare Park Association, and we're from Southfield to Evergreen. We have a serious concern of this blight over here. We need more enforcement for you to really make get these people to realize the, viol the, the um, blight violation because nothing is being done. We're still having problems with advanced and waste management of this pickup. Even if they put tickets on this merchandise on the um, bug, we, it's still to the point they're not going to put it back and leave. They're going to still leave it out. We need something done about that. Also, I want to speak on too. Uh, with summer coming up, we're going to have serious problems. We need more police enforcement to come out in the neighborhood. We have um, fixed the O'Hara Park is about to open up. We have a walk. People are going to be walking and running around the park. It's going to be a lot of people. They're drinking over there and they're doing things. So we need more policemen over here. But we do need, Mayor, the whole issue or the whole thing, what I'm really, we need this blight. You I'm, really need to enforce this blight. It is so important and serious. Right, so, but, so let me, I'm going to try to take these quickly myself because I want to get as many calls as I can. Uh, Dave Bell will be out to look at the properties in your area for blight tickets. Ron Brundage is here, who's responsible for trash pickup. Uh, I know that he's going to follow up. We put way too much money in O'Hare Park uh, in the last few years. It, it turned out beautiful, didn't it? Uh, and we're going to protect it. And so Chief Craig and I have been going over the staffing plans for the park patrols for this summer. You are going to see uh, a significant uh, police presence uh, in the parks. Uh, and so uh, uh, you're, you're, I, I love your neighborhood, and we'll, we'll make a real commitment to cleaning these things up. Okay, next is Deanne. Okay, Deanne, let us know where you live. Hey, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mayor Duggan. I am Deanne from Six Mile in Livernois. And my question is, in regards to um, planning, in regards to community outreach, what is the plan to increase information on vaccine information so that we can make sure that everyone in the city is getting vaccinated? Yeah, and so I don't know if you saw at the beginning, we ran the first of what's going to be a major uh, advertising campaign because I agree with you we've we've done what we can do in these public announcements uh, we need to start to be in a really aggressive ad campaign so you're gonna see a lot of uh, ad videos like I showed earlier of people in Detroit getting the vaccine and talking about the experience uh, and uh, and it sounds like uh, you probably uh, have a number of people that you talk to and everybody that you can encourage have you been vaccinated yet Should you made it Okay. All right. Uh, so, but you're, it's a good point, and we're going to ramp up the advertising. All right. Who's next? Next is Ruben. Ruben, you're up. Ruben, you may unmute yourself. Let's move on to Abbas. Okay, Abbas, you're up. Yes. Hello. No, can, can you hear me? Uh, Thank uh, you, Mike Duggan. We can hear everybody. Can you hear me? We have Ruben and Abbas. Oh, Thank you, Mike okay. Duggan. Can we meet really one of the two of them? This is Ruben. This okay. is Ruben. Okay, we're going to take Ruben first, then Abbas. Go ahead. Hello? Go ahead. You have a question? Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate you taking the time to look into matters. And the whole city council is on a... Um, Appreciate your leadership. I really thank you the whole city for the council. bottom of my soul because right now the city of Detroit needs a leader and it needs someone to step up, someone that's going to say the things that need to be said and do the things that need to be done. And I think that uh, this is a perfect opportunity for you to, uh, how should I say, make a contract. Like the contract with America, you make a contract with Detroiters to stand up to your oath and rid the city of all the corruption that exists and get to the bottom of everything. We need help. We need someone that's going to stand up for us and someone who is dedicated, someone who is demonstrating that they are willing to do whatever it takes, someone who has no fear and is unafraid to face challenges and bring the city together and unite under one umbrella 
time. All right. Well, I hope he doesn't run against me. He's got a heck of a stub speech. All right. Uh, we're back to Abbas, I think. Abbas, you're next. Hi. Hello. Uh, good evening. Um, my name Sorry is about Abbas, that. Abbas Al-Hajj. Um, uh, no problem. I live in the uh, north end, and I wanted to also kind of echo my neighbor's uh, uh, comments regarding the north, uh, north end landing uh, development. And again, like, you know, kind of, uh, kind of, building out what they were saying regarding like home ownership. I think that's kind of like the biggest thing. I know that there's a lot of us, myself included, that are working um, with some developers who are doing successful projects in the neighborhood to come up with an alternative proposal and just want to make sure that this is like, you know, our voices are heard and kind of understood and that we have the opportunity or at least to get something else. So there's some kind of maybe like RFP or something, um, or at least the chance to get an alternative proposal in front of the city uh, for something that I think the neighbors can, you know, rally around. Well, I'm going to listen with an open mind. I haven't made up my mind uh, about this. So we're going to get you engaged, and uh, we'll come up with something that's fair. I really I feel like we ought to be able to find something that works for everybody, and we're going to try hard to do that. Next is phone number ending in 973. Hello? Hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good. Introduce yourself and tell us where you live. Yeah, this is Miss George. I live in the um, the uh, District 6. Uh, don't know how long I'll be there because all the crime is pushing us out. But I wanted to say that um, that I'm hoping, I'm glad uh, Chief Craig, hi Chief Craig, is on the line that keep, we got to get that spot shotter because in certain areas they just shoot all night. And by the grace of God, those bullets haven't gone to anybody's home uh, in a second police precinct. And number two, the reason for all the speeding, and, and people do not realize that this, I don't understand the recreational use of marijuana, and we have to get it on a federal level because they need to let people out of jail for they're going to legalize it. But people do not realize marijuana increases psychosis. It increases your heart rate 50 beats a minute. And, it, and it's also can trigger heart attacks. So when we see some of the violence, I know it's not, you know, the violence we see because it's the wicked of man's heart. But we're also seeing with all of this legalization of marijuana, they just caught a guy speeding 120 miles. And I know Chief Craig, no, I know they're burdened. We're working on police officers getting more money. But this is what's happening. I want your listening audience to realize this. When I was working with the county, Oakland County, we had an international speaker speak to us over 10 years ago, talking about the legalization of marijuana in Colorado and all of the accidents, all of the speeding, all of the high insurance rates. This is all right. Thank you very much. And, and uh, I know the chief has had enormous success with shot spotter just in the first week or two on the east side. Two major busts uh, as a result of it, uh, uh, letting us know where shots were fired, where we might not have gotten a report. Uh, and I know he's very anxious to extend it. Uh, to other neighbors in the city, and we'll take a look at your neighborhood. Who's next? Next, phone number ending in 677. Okay, I know we're supposed to wrap up at 8.30, but I'm going to go a little bit longer and see if we can get to as many questions as we can. Uh, if your number ends in 677, uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, good evening, Mayor. I'm Greg Irvin, president of the Harriet Tubman Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Block Club on Goldburn between Lappin and Pinewood. That's District 3. Scott Benson uh, and uh, Ernest Johnson and Kayana Sessoms. Listen, uh, I was told that we got our name, our, our block club is kind of old. We like have members that are 70s and their 80s. So a lot of them don't know how to use the Zoom yet. Right. So we got to get somebody who to teach them. But also, we got uh, uh, our name on the uh, the hump list, and we wanted to see if about because uh, you got two different type of humps, and we wanted to see about getting our, our members want the the asphalt humps put on our on our street because we got we got we got on Goldberg we got we got like drag strip, even in the wintertime we they dragging over here. So do you have speed also? Humps now? Uh, do you, do you have yeah, they, they drag over here. They they drag race in our street. So do you have from eight mile to seven mile? Do you have? But anyway, now? when you say you want to ask, we, we on the time. Okay. Yeah, we want to ask. 
Okay. So we, we are lo by and large doing asphalt unless we think we're going to repave the road. Then we put the temporary ones in. Uh, so if you're on the list, the chances are very good uh, that asphalt is what you're going to get. Okay. Who's next? Next is Bianca. Hey, Bianca, you're up. Bianca, you may unmute yourself. Next is Lisa. Hey, Lisa. Hello. How are you? Hello. No, this is Bianca. All right. Good to hear from you. Where do you live? I live on um, Garland and Mac. Okay. And I just want to... Um, thank the district for department neighborhoods because we now have a block club. Um, the crime has now decreased on our block and we want the mayor to come out and actually see the work that we have done um, so that the Motor City makeover will not get the credit, but our block can get the credit because we have done a lot of work over here. And it's because of our block coming together and Dennis and his office really helping us. So we want you to come out and see it. Do you think that can happen? It, it can happen. I spent a fair amount of time about a block away from you at uh, uh, Garland and Charlevoix at the Sweet House where we're uh, doing some things to commemorate uh, Dr. Ocean Sweet. He's a, a block or so. Uh, south of you, but I would love to come over and see what you're doing. Okay, thank you. So I'll just, I'll follow up with um, Shador and Dennis to make sure that this That'd happens. That'd be great. I, I will definitely come out. Thank you. Next is John. Hello, this is John Myers from the east side. How are you? First District 4, and uh, I want to say I really appreciate the noticeable changes you've made and especially, uh, I'll, I'll, the first question is going to be easy. Thank you so much for getting the street sweeping back. Can we now do something about the inconsiderate folks that don't that choose not to move their vehicles uh, for the street sweeping, so we can make it all beautiful? So uh, it's the it's, same. It's something we've been debating. I'm going to let Ron Brundage, our DPW director. Uh, address this because uh, this is this is something we debate every year, and uh, I'll let I'll let Ron share the thinking on it. And then I have a second question. Uh, good evening, John. Thanks a lot Thank for you. your question. I think, as you know, this is uh, this will be the fourth year since we reinstituted uh, the residential street sweeping program and. Initially, one of the things that we wanted to make certain is that we really wanted to get out there and just focus on getting the streets clean. We didn't want to uh, set up a program that was geared around ticketing uh, any of our residents. We try to do as much as we can uh, to get advance notice out. I think, as you're aware, uh, we actually uh, post two days before we come out and, and actually sweep the streets. So we try to get as much information out there in advance to minimize the number of vehicles uh, that, are, that are parked there. Uh, but I think now we're getting to a point where we're seeing that that's only getting us so far. And of course, as you indicated, we really want to maximize the impact uh, when we go through and do the residential sweeping. And we'll be doing two cycles this year. So I think it is time for us to really have a conversation about, you know, what can we do differently or what, what can we do additionally uh, to increase the amount of vehicles that get off the street. Uh, we're going to be starting our program in about three weeks. Uh, for this year, so that's not going to be a part of our program in 2021. But again, I think you bring up bring up bring up a really good point, and I think we really need to start having a, a conversation about whether or not potential enforcement needs to be a part of our program in future years. Go, go ahead. You, you had another question. Did we lose you? Okay, this this is Lisa. Lisa Franklin. Hi, Mayor Duggan. How right. are you? Good. Good. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the Office of Disability Affairs and looking forward to what comes out of that office and hope that you can uh, increase the funding there so we that we can see a full office one day. But um, I was born and raised in the city of Detroit in uh, Virginia Park District. So I really hope that that name doesn't change. My father did a lot of work in that area after the uh, rebellion in 67. 
So I really would like to see that name stay. I don't think the name is going to change. Okay. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. But in regards to the homes that the land bank is rehabbing and that the city is rehabbing, I had to move out of the city of Detroit about seven years ago because of lack of affordable, accessible housing. I would like to see some of those homes modified for people with disabilities so that we can have the same opportunities to live in those homes that are modified by the city. My husband is a retiree of the city of Detroit. And you know that program is offered to our family to get those homes at half price, but none of them are wheelchair accessible. So if they cannot uh, be, well, if they can be modified and they are not currently modified, if there is a program that you can put in place that would reduce the cost of modification for those homes. Well, that's a, you know, this is why I love doing these things. So that's all of the uh, uh, meetings I've done. Nobody's ever suggested that before. So let us go back uh, and take a look at that. But I think that is a really interesting idea. And let us see if we can come up with a way to do it. Thank you for that call. Uh, sorry, next is Darnell. Hey, Darnell, you're up. Darnell, are you with us? Darnell. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Good evening. Hi. Okay, so I'm here with my wife, Katrina, and one of the things that we wanted to talk about was, uh, again, the thing with the undercover vehicles is a great idea, and it's been a long time coming. Um, we think that that would help a lot. We have a lot of racing going up and down our street. We're in District We're 5. We're in District 5. We're... You know, with that stuff. <laughs> you want to let Katrina take the phone? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and again, that's, that's great, and we're looking forward to it. One of the other things that we like to talk about is whether or not we can get shot spotter in our neighborhood. Um, we're on Carter between Dexter and Homer. I, lie in, I lay in bed at night and actually start counting the bullets that we hear and it's at least every three or four nights and it's worse in the summertime. I mean, it's me and some of my neighbors have walked around the block and seen people lying on the, on the ground that has gotten shot. So we really like to get something done about this. Yeah, as the mayor indicated, uh, you know, we want to expand shot spotter. We know it works, uh, but uh, as we begin to roll that out, um, are you working with the 10th precinct? Uh, uh, Commander Tiffany Stewart, have you had any conversations with her or the neighborhood police officer? Maybe it's something we can do uh, with our special ops unit. I haven't spoke with her as of yet, no. Yeah, well, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, we, if we can get your number, I will make sure I have uh, Assistant Chief Bettison here who will um, make sure that uh, someone from his office or the commander will give you a call in the meantime. But we are absolutely committed to expanding Shot Spotter. That sounds great. I really appreciate it. And Mayor Duggan, we think you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Cornelius. Hey, Cornelius, you're up. Hey, how are you doing, Mayor? Good evening. Uh, I'm actually, my name is Cornelius Harris. I've uh, got a business over in the Lower North End. And uh, I wanted to echo some of the concerns that people have about the uh, developments that are going on. And I think that you're actually absolutely right about uh, how you have apartments uh, on Woodward and things like that. I think the issue is that this is actually more in the neighborhood yeah. as opposed to on the main street. But I, but I would hope that, I don't, and I don't know if this is possible, uh, to maybe actually to, to meet with the North End uh, groups and to be able to, to, to do something like that, to, just so that people can actually share those ideas with you and to, to, to have that type of communication. I, I, I've told uh, Malia Howard, our district manager, I, I want to be engaged uh, before this is over uh, because uh, this, this has potential. It's got emotions on both sides. And it's one of those things, if we can just bring the emotions down, uh, I think there's a solution here that's good that doesn't change the character of the neighborhood. But I'm sure I'm going to be engaged myself before it's over. I'm going to let uh, the planning team take the first couple meetings. But I'll be there before it's over. Okay, and I'm sorry, I got one more uh, question, um, because I've, I've noticed how everyone has been talking about this, this issue with the racing. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, and again, I, I mentioned at the last uh, uh, 
talk to you, David, uh, last year uh, about uh, having a drag strip. Uh, we did the one event at the city airport. Yeah. Uh, then the FAA said we can't do that again. They, for some reason, they think that runway is intended for planes. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know how the chief got the uh, got him to shut it down that day. <laughs> Uh, but, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at the problem is that as, as hard as this sounds, the city of Detroit doesn't have some long stretch of land that isn't near neighborhoods uh, to do this other than the airport. So the chief has been, he's a drag racing nut himself, uh, and he's been looking for a, uh, a solution. If you've got an idea, uh, we are open to it uh, because I, I would like to see there be an outlet uh, where where those where folks can express their love for their high performance vehicles in an appropriate way. Next is Mr. Beasley. Hey, Mr. Beasley, you're up. We'll move on to Johnson. Hello, it's Mr. Beasley. All right. How are you? All right. Hi, right. how are you doing, Mr. Mayor? Good. Hi, I live in a university uh, district of Detroit, and I'm a, a lifelong uh, Detroiter. And uh, one of the things that I hold a very dear uh, to our heart, and I think that we're missing a mark on, is uh, closing the achievement gap for uh, the children of the city of Detroit. I think that it's absolutely uh, unacceptable that with the last state exam, we have a 15% uh, literacy rate or proficiency rate and affects us all. Uh, I don't know if you knew, but the Brookings Institute estimated uh, that the market values of the homeowners of the city of Detroit, which I happen to be one of them, is uh, depressed by almost 40% just because of a poor school district. No question. Uh, we, yeah, so my, my question to you is would you uh, support public policy? that follows the law and closes and, and closes the achievement gap in Detroit within 10 years. Well, so I joined uh, the litigation, uh, the literacy litigation, which we won and the governor uh, actually settled uh, to get uh, the Detroit public schools more money. Uh, and I, I have to be careful because in the city of Detroit, the mayor does not run the school system. There's a separately elected school board and I respect that. Uh, but I do want to be uh, the best friend of the school. So I was active uh, with Reverend Wendell Anthony and DTE to raise uh, $22 million to get laptops uh, for all of our students so education could continue at home. The next thing I'm really pushing, and this is something Dr. Vitti has talked about, is the number of children who come to kindergarten who don't know their letters and numbers. Uh, they are starting behind. And so I am in Lansing right now lobbying very hard. Uh, and I think I'm going to get it done this time. This is my third time around. I don't get discouraged too easily. But uh, I want every four-year-old in the city of Detroit uh, to have full-day pre-K, quality pre-K with standards, uh, and get these uh, uh, children uh, a real head start. And so I'm going to do everything that's appropriate uh, in as the role as mayor. Uh, and um, as far as the operation of the public schools, uh, that's that's really something that that has to be handled by the school board. Okay. Next is Johnson. All right, John, we've got to get a better system uh, than this. Georgia. Hello, good evening, Mayor Duggan and to all the leadership. This is Georgia Cole over at the LaSalle Beautiful, president of the LaSalle Beautiful Block Club. It's good to see you all. Good to talk Great to job. You. We really appreciate you, Mayor, for all that you do here in District 5. Wanted to give out a quick shout to um, our DON, Malia Howard, and to our District 10, District 5, um, 10th Precinct 
MPOs for such a phenomenal job. You started something that we had major issues with, and I am so happy to report that this thing has finally taken a change uh, for the all of the uh, dumping, the illegal cars, the chop shop situation like that. But real quickly, Mayor, if we don't have any solutions in, in a situation like this, if we could just talk, Malia and I and MPOs, we've been talking, but we believe we have a really good um, structure that we can do, not just with the guys, because those guys are actually talented. Time. There are some ways their building can be put for them to actually put their talents in, in, in fixing cars. Um, some of them are actually legitimate mechanics. So just to throw that out there, I really wanted to get that out there. And if we could do something and give them a building, There's I something. will help sponsor it or something. We will help them because they're, they're trying now. Hi. So thank you. Well, and thank you. And, and we were able to make progress in your neighborhood because of the commitment of you and the neighbor association. It is so much easier. Uh, to get control of problems uh, when the neighborhood police officers could work hand in glove with the block club leadership. And thank you for what you did over there. Next is Ms. Mary. Ms. Mary, you're up. You may unmute yourself. Okay, we'll go next to phone number ending in. 093. Okay, if your phone number ends in my name, there we uh, go. This is uh, Peggy Novo. <laughs> Hi, Mayor Duggan. How are you, Peggy? How's it going over there? It's going pretty good. Uh, I just want to thank you for all the things that you have done for the city of Detroit. Ever since they took your name off the ballot, we got out there and screamed <laughs> and hollered, and we got you uh, voted in. So I hope you continue the work that you have been doing for this beautiful city of Detroit. Uh, the question that I have, uh, Mayor Duggan, is these investors that's coming into our community, buying up all this property and turning the property over to property managers, they are not taking care of the properties. We have some nice homes here in College Park, some beautiful brick homes, and they're putting these renters in these beautiful homes, and the, the trash is all out in front of the house. Some of them is barbecuing on the porch. We haven't been able to go out because of the Corvette, but hopefully Motor City Makeover, we're going to try to get a group of volunteers to try to go out and help us talk to these folks, but is there anything So, so you there, can there is. So Dave Bell, uh, this is the head of the Fenmore Street Block Club, uh, and she has all of my telephone numbers. So I would appreciate it, Dave, if you would get out there, uh, and that neighborhood over in the 7 Southfield area is, is really coming back, uh, and we need to make sure, uh, I welcome quality landlords, uh, but we will crack down uh, on those who aren't doing it. So. Uh, Peggy, Dave Bell will be out to the neighborhood, uh, and uh, we'll see if we can't get you some enforcement. Hey, we have uh, Ms. Saunders. Okay. This is me. I'm on now. You are. Good For evening. Me. Hi, Mr. Mayor. How are Met you? with you in 2015 when you were doing those home things, and I came down to your office. But anyway, to get to my point is this. I've noticed that other cities have a way to get or dispose of shredding and i wondered if we are having any upcoming shredding events that's number one and chief craig if you're listening i want to commend both you and the mayor for the outstanding job you do and i love your no nonsense approach to crime mr uh mr chief i'm telling you i love it but anyway i, eight, I live eight mile in schaefer okay. and everybody's been talking about the drag strip i can lay in my bed at night i'm in blackstone manor cooperative and I hear, I mean, it's like a drag strip down there. Has anybody been able to see if we, if the drag strip racers want to use the state fair? Is that adequate? Uh, not anymore. Property. Uh, not anymore. We're putting uh, development in the state fair. Uh, but Jay, uh, you're starting to get the idea here that we got. We're going to support the chief. Uh, Ron, uh, what's the story? Do we have a place to dispose of shredded 
material? Okay. So we're going to take your name or number, and Ron Brundage is going to call you and let you know uh, what the options are on shredded material. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next is a caller on Samsung. Sorry for the slow. Okay. An anonymous person on Samsung. You're unmuted. Let's move on to phone number ending in 196. Hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good evening. Yes, hi. Good afternoon. Good evening, uh, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, and um, I'm like just like you know all the other sentiments that has been spoken. Uh, the gentleman who was uh, from District Six. I am from District Six, and I am uh, the Midwest uh, Black Club Association. And uh, like everyone else, we're having problems with the uh, the fast moving cars. Uh, I mean, drag racing down the street. I, I called uh, someone last year, and they said we were on the list to get the speed bumps. I don't know. Hopefully, we can get those this this summer. And also, the uh, the light and the uh, the rubbish that's that's constantly. I just wish you could come out and just just take a take a look, just right around the neighborhood, and and look at the constant amount of uh, debris that's on the street. You know, they pick it up one day, and next day it's back down there again. And we are having problems with the tires. You know, we don't. You know, where are these tires coming from? We have a lot of uh, auto auto shops is around there, here. Is there a particular street? So they're, they're coming from them, and they they bring them during the night and leave them on our in our neighborhood. So you know, they've all, they they you know we've heard that they they don't like <laughs> Detroit. They think it's a dump. So they dump everything in here. So d is there a particular street that's a prime dumping ground? You still with me? All right, uh, Ron, let's, let's find out in the Neighborhood Association. Uh, but we, we have put hidden cameras up in a number of the prime dumping areas and seized lots of vehicles. And so uh, uh, if I, we, yeah, oh, you're I'm there? in Midwest. I'm sorry. I'm in Midwest Black Club area. If if we had uh, one, I'm on Tyre, I'm on Prairie and, and American. There's a stop sign right at my corner, and a lot of times they don't even adhere to that stop okay. sign. They so, just, so, is there a particular street that gets most of the dumping? Well, I live on Prairie. So, Prairie is where we should look. There's Prairie, Mackenzie. There's, okay. Uh, All right. uh, I know where I know where you are. We're going to be out and check it out and see what we can do. Yeah, just ride around and just take a look. Yeah. You know, don't, don't take my word for it. I, I, I believe you. You sound like you know what's going on in your neighborhood. So we're going to see if we can't do something yeah. to tighten the enforcement. Miss Polly Cheek, so you know, she's our president. So okay. <laughs> All right, we'll be out. Thank you. Phone number ending in 818. Good evening, Mayor Duggan. Good evening. Um, first and foremost, I want to give a big shout out to the District 6 manager. I live in District 6. Um, Eva Torres is an amazing District 6 manager. She's always answering my phone calls when we call her office, um, providing the community with resources. Um, now, my concern tonight would be um, what is going to be the plan for the ignorance that is happening at the state park, the Riverside Park. Um, it's constantly filled with people drinking, they're fighting, being rowdy. Um, as you are aware, there is a playground, and I do have a four-year-old um, that we like to frequently go and play. So I just wanted to ask you tonight, what would be the plan that you guys have in um, correcting that? Uh, thank you for your question. As was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, one of our plans is certainly uh, launching our park patrol, which we are doing now. Uh, we recognize that um, a lot of people are not deciding to go to Bell Isle. And so they're going to a lot of neighborhood parks. So we will have a parks patrol, and they will be out. Uh, uh, ironic, that was in Harris Park yesterday when we did our press conference on the, on the racing, and I couldn't believe the number of people that were congregating in the park. It, everybody was peaceful, but we know it's an issue, and, and so that's another one of our top priorities. Now, 
we, we put a lot of money into Riverside Park and it's attracted big crowds and now we have to address it. And uh, the chief is well aware we had a special task force that dealt with it last summer and uh, we will be back out again. Uh, and this is it. If you're going to build up first class parks, you're going to uh, do this. We're running about a half hour over. I'll take two more questions tonight. And then when is the next one of these? Okay, so next Wednesday at 7 o'clock, uh, we're doing another one. It'll be focused more on District 1, but if we didn't get you tonight, uh, we will get you next week. So we'll take two more. Who's next? Next is Tammy. Okay, Tammy, you're up. I can't believe it. I'm going to be one of the last people. This is my first time calling. Very excited. I think I'm in District 1. So okay. I have a couple things I want to comment on. As far as the street racers go, I totally agree. They need a place that they can actually do this activity without being policed because it, 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 need, it just needs an outlet. And I'm going to say a lot of adversarial type things because the people who love these high power vehicles, they're so proud of them. They spend a lot of time, you know, just making them uh, be something that stands out to them and they just want to go show off. So yes, they need a place to go. And I agree with whoever said that they, a lot of these people have so much talent where they know how to customize and repair and so forth and so on. They have a place where they can actually put that type of energy into a work related activity, that's even better. Fine. And then the other thing I want to talk about is the blight. Yes, Detroit looks like a dump, there's trash everywhere. And the last thing is, where do people go for the affordable new housing? Fine. So uh, if you go to the city website uh, in the housing section and there is a, a list of every single uh, apartment building uh, in, in the city that's got affordable units. Uh, so DetroitMI.gov and go to housing. Okay, okay, next is Arnie. Okay, last call of the evening. Hello, Mayor Duggan. My name is Arnie Corlin. I am a native Detroiter, lived in the Bagley neighborhood years ago. I'm from Los Angeles now. I've been involved in uh, Detroit homecoming. Can't wait to get back. Uh, there's a couple of things that I, and I've actually heard on the call today that I would like to do to help you. Um, and I can actually do some of that from here. But before I do that, I just want to give a quick shout out to Chief Craig and Assistant Chief Bettison. I understand if he's there. Um, so in Los Angeles, part of this has to do with uh, helping you on your vaccine rollout. Uh, in Los Angeles, I'm a rental property owner and manager, and uh, especially in some of our most challenged communities. And one of the biggest challenges, and as an owner, as a manager, and my other residents, we all know who those seniors are and those individuals that don't have access to computers to get those vaccines. So what we did was I put a call out to hundreds of other owners, their residents, and uh, I don't know how many people we've had vaccinated to, to date, but I'd be more than help, happy to help you because those owners and managers and tenants know exactly who those individuals are that don't have that access. That's number one. Uh, number two, as a rental property owner, um, as a peer and mentor, and I know you've had some challenges with your rental properties there, there are some things that I do here that I can actually help you with, with there. Um, I'm a big fan of, of peer and mentor or that peer pressure if necessary. So I put together a team here. What we do is we reach out to those nuisance rental property owners and more often than not, they'll change their behaviors before you have to use city services. So if you'd like, I'll be glad to help you. All right. Well, I appreciate the interest. And, uh, I, you know, I knew we've reached out to a lot of neighborhoods, but I think uh, we set a record uh, getting a phone call from Los Angeles on a neighborhood meeting. So thank you for the call. And uh, we will follow up. Thank you for everybody uh, staying with me. And next Wednesday, 7 o'clock, uh, District 1, uh, we'll do this again. Have a great evening.